What's up, guys? Welcome into a week 10 edition of Chargers Weekly. I got my guy back, fresh yeah. off an electric appearance on the Pat McAfee show with the Vipers and the tank top. Pat Buddy Smith is back, brother. What's up? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's great to, to, to hang out with Pat, one of my absolute favorite people affiliated with the NFL and uh, talk some Chargers football, uh, talk about, you know, Justin Herbert, the humble superstar, just uh, gets so uncomfortable when you say good things about him. Otherwise, oh, yeah. I'm sure he'd be doing a whole lot more interviews than he already does. But uh, that's one of the things that uh, makes us love him as much as we do. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. If you missed it, just check out the, uh, the Pat McAfee stuff on his YouTube channel. I just posted a ton of videos from all the fun we had yesterday and yeah that's what's going to happen when you go on with pat just like here chris i go on with you what do we do we have a lot of fun but instead yeah. it's a little more get you ready for the game and my apologies for missing last week dealing with the covid stuff but thankfully i'm through it so thanks to all the fans out there that were hitting me up on the social media channels i certainly uh, appreciate all your well wishes as i'm ready to get back in the booth missing two games was not fun i'm never going to have that chick hearn streak you know mm. damn it it's okay I, you know what if it's any consolation i i was in philly and someone's screaming at me on the field, calling me Matt Money Smith, oh, telling good. me they love my work. Perfect. It, it happens. It happens almost every other game, and, and I love, I love it. it. I, it's I'm very humbled by it because they think I'm Matt Money Smith, but it, hey. it's just hilarious. They wanted me to sign his beer can, so uh, I love it. So you did. <laughs> <laughs> just I love it. Hey, we're two stiff white guys. You know, it's yeah. uh, you, you can you know just plug and play, figure it out. Stiff white guys with a side part. There you yep. go. That's what we are. Hey, Philly, w watching that game, man. Just uh, your reaction to that kind of gutty performance to to get back in the win column. You know, I was texting with uh, with Shannon Farron and, and DJ a little bit through the broadcast, and I said, man, this is not for me. I, I need the distraction of calling the game and being responsible for what's happening in the game because, man, the Chargers, they are they are a heart attack team. You know, they just are. It is it is stressful wins. It's stressful losses. Uh, and I and it's interesting. I'm almost kind of happy I got to watch it from that perspective instead of, you know, when you're calling a game, you're. You're trying to develop a storyline. You're trying to figure out, oh, I've got all these stats, and does this one fit here? So there's so many moving pieces that a, a lot of times um, you sort of miss maybe a big picture or, or some of the takeaways that, that I was able to gather uh, in, in doing just pregame, halftime, and post, and actually watching the game in that manner, just kind of thinking about what I wanted to talk about at halftime, what I wanted to talk about at post. And I think that, to me, the number one thing of, of all, look, every team has issues. But to me, the number one thing that has got to be, um, has got to be fixed is third down defense. Uh, that, that is what really jumped out to me is this defense is allowing teams to just churn clock and keep a really, really good offense off the field. And I think that's how the Chargers end up in all these close games because their offense simply doesn't have enough opportunities to pull away. Uh, because you're getting five and seven and eight and a half minute drives that the defense is allowing these 12 and 15 play drives and all this run that's keeping the clock running. So to me, that's the number one thing that has got to be sorted out uh, if this team is, is going to make the playoffs and make a run in the playoffs. It's funny you say that because the first thing I noticed in the game was like, all right, time of possession back in their favor in that first quarter, right? They, they, they possessed the ball for over 10 minutes in the first quarter, just like that it was evened out by halftime yeah. because of those long runs and, and yeah. sustaining drives by the opposition. Philly was able to run the football and, you know, that's been an issue all year long. And, and I think it, it's gotten a little bit better, but with Dalvin cook on deck, that's probably my biggest concern too. money is just the fact that you were, you were thin in the secondary and, you know, you have the opposition controlling the clock. Um, that's a recipe for disaster. If, if you don't get that buttoned up. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the two go hand in hand, right? One, the, the, the run, when you allow a team to run the ball, the clock is, is running. And two, when you can't get off on third down, well, now the clock's running for a new set of downs. And I think the one, the one thing they may have going for them, because look, you, you look at the Patriots game, right? And they kicked four field goals and scored a touchdown on offense. You know, they were able to, and, and that running game, even though it went for 140 yards, it was at three, six, a carry. So it was yeah. inefficient. They didn't want to put the ball in Mac Jones hands. And again, the guy led five scoring drives of which, four were field goals, you'll take it. Uh, you look at the Eagles 
And, you know, if it wasn't Jalen Hurts, and I know that's kind of, it sounds weird when you say it. Well, yeah, it was. And they still ran for four, nearly five yards per carry and 170 yards. Yes, but not every team has a Jalen Hurts. That changes the dynamic completely. And when it was just running plays, you know, again, it was like three, eight a carry, I think, for Jordan Howard and, and Boston Scott and whomever was carrying the football. So what I'm getting at is Kirk Cousins is a lot more Mac Jones than Jalen Hurts. So maybe with the return of Justin Jones, with what looks to be Kenneth Murray coming back, along with Drew Tranquil and how great Kaiser White's been playing, the fact that Nasir Adderley is back up there at free, I feel like, you know, you can maybe deal with Dalvin Cook a little better than you did the Philly run game because you have zero threat of run from Kirk Cousins. So I'm hopeful it looks a little bit more like the New England game. You know, before I get into this Vikings team, uh, we have Courtney Cronin of, of ESPN coming up a little bit later to get this week's opposing view. And, and Kevin Kugler of Fox Sports, the Chargers' first Fox game of the year, going to join me in money. But, you know, Brandon Staley also talked about Dalvin Cook in the screen game. So, though, I mean, yeah. those are almost extended runs there, too. So being able to contain him and... I realize Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen and the way Kirk Cousins has played, his stats look really, really good. But Cook's going to make that engine go. I think he had a 60 plus yard run against the Ravens. And but like, that was it, Chris. Like that was what was interesting about Dalvin's yeah. day is that was all he had really. It was like 2.7 if you took that out, right? Exactly. So I think that's, you know, something to, to also keep in mind. But that's, you know, that's kind of the that's the double edged short sword, right? I mean, Dalvin's that good. And so the Chargers tackling better be spot on because if you don't get that guy down, he is as explosive as, as any runner in the game. And he can, he can take it to the house, you know, and he can take it to the house through traffic. He's just that good of a runner. One thing I, you know, and again, I, I, I almost told, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not coming off like someone who's complaining or anything on these things because the Chargers are five and three and in first place. Sure. But again, just observations like the one thing, also that really stood out to me in that Philly game. And I'm anxious to see with Dalvin and how dynamic a runner he is, if it's going to change. I mean, I get it. Brandon Staley's got a, a style of defense that he wants to run, but man, it is so painful to see Derwin James 15 yards from the ball on 50% of the snaps because they're in that too high shell. And with how good Thielen and Justin Jefferson are and, and how well Kirk Cousins is throwing the ball, I just I hate the idea of Derwin not being closer to the ball and involved in more plays. To me, that's that was the other thing that really stood out is, man, he's just he's just out of the action. He's 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 high and they're preventing those big plays and forcing teams to play him underneath. And I would just I would love to see him closer to the action because we just know how special he is, how dynamic he is. No matter where you ask him to play, that dude figures out the best way to blow up action and and affect you know an offense defensively maybe he gets up close and personal with his former college teammate Alvin right this exactly time. yeah th that'd be fun to see you know offensively after two performances we weren't accustomed to seeing by Justin Herbert um, and listen I realized before we get into his stats a lot of quarterbacks have done this to the Philadelphia Eagles yeah. this year I think five quarterbacks have thrown and completed 80 percent of their passes but you know, a win's a win, 32 of 38, 356 yards, 84% completion percentage. And it started with Keenan, right? You know, that connection wasn't what we're accustomed to seeing either. Um, he was targeted 13 times. He caught 12 of them. And I thought that first drive really kind of set the tone for the offense. Yeah, you know, we had heard that, you know, here's here's a, a vet, one of the best receivers in the game, willing to commit to extra practice throughout the week. Just wasn't really comfortable with how things had gone the previous two games. And look, that, that was, that was both sides of that relationship too. Like Keenan had some very odd drops, which I, I mean, I think I might've counted three drops all of last season. Uh, and, you know, he was having two drops in a game here and there. It's just very strange. So I think what we saw was the fruit of that labor, you know, and, and that was these guys for whatever reason, just something wasn't clicking between the two of them. You know, we heard that they worked on it all week in practice, and there it was. Like you said, 13 targets, 12 catches, none of which I think it what was it, a third and 18. That was that might have been the throw of the game, the play of the game. And, you know, that's just what Keenan does. He's so good. And I know Justin talked about it after the game. He's like, you know, or, or maybe it was Coach Staley who talked about it, who just said, hey, you know, the thing that Keenan does is he knows how to make himself available. Like you always say, well, the defense knows where he's, you know, where this ball's going. How's he able to do it? Well, that's the difference. That's what makes Keenan 
one of the greatest receivers in the NFL is he understands exactly where he needs to be to make himself available, where the defense is going to be, how to position himself away from them. And, and there's that relationship then between he and Justin Herbert, because they both know, and that's how you convert all those third and fourth downs. And it was just awesome to see because man, that was a real struggle for two games uh, against the Pats and the Ravens. And I think some people were starting to get worried, like, oh, no, did, did the league figure him out? It's only his 23rd game. And, you know, I think those are valid questions to ask. But, you know, the answer is no, absolutely they didn't. Whatever, the, you know, was kind of de- whatever they were dealing with for those two weeks looks to be sorted out. You got the deep connection to Mike Williams. Uh, again, 13 targets, 12 catches. You got both tight ends involved. We know how much Justin likes to work with his tight ends, specifically in the red zone. That was a big factor. So. It was it was awesome to see. And and I think, you know, just to make a long conversation longer here for me, Chris, is, uh, it, it, you know, I, even though it came against the Eagles and you set it five games of 80 percent completions already, that's already tied the record of futility over the course of an entire season in the NFL. But, you know, I think you can have layups in games and I think you can have layup games as well. And to me, that was important for Justin to just kind of get back on track going through these next couple of weeks against the Vikings, the Steelers, you know, and the Bengals, three very, very good teams that, that are certainly capable of getting a win and, and aren't going to make it easy on the Chargers. Yeah, we mentioned, you know, Keenan kind of set the tone, but Mike got involved that that big 49-yard reception. And you said it, you know, I've been just really impressed with this tight end group as a whole. You know, Parham, Cook, uh, Steven Anderson, I, I think those guys combined for 11 catches, 126 yards, pair of touchdowns. Cook had a two-point conversion. Trey McKitty's getting in the mix blocking. So, yeah. you know, I think people were worried, what, okay, how are you going to replace Hunter Henry? They've been able to do it with this collection of, of, of tight ends, and they all kind of bring something different and unique to the table, and Justin's finding all of them. Yeah, I'm excited, um, or I shouldn't say excited. I'm happy that, that Steven Anderson was rewarded for all yeah. of the, the dirty work that he does. You know, they've, and it's been interesting, right? They've made Gabe neighbors inactive, a healthy scratch these last two games, because, you know, quite simply of what Anderson brings, he's able to do, you know, he's able to be a lead blocker and, he, and he's a willing blocker. You often hear that. And I think people that maybe don't know what that means, like, Hey, sometimes guys will block and they'll, they'll take their assignments and they'll go execute. But, they're not willing blockers. Like they're not seeking that contact, appreciating that contact. Um, and that's what Steven Anderson's done. And then when you're able to combine that, something that he is able to replace from Gabe Neighbors, who's an awesome lead fullback. Um, but then when you add in that big target uh, and the ability to catch, and you saw it in that game, you know, and, and just if, if people have, like I, I've said it before, like I love game pass and, and I can't recommend it enough, but if you, if you're able to go back and watch the game and, and kind of watch, especially what they call the all 22, the coaches film, man, you look at the push. There are two pivotal plays in there. One from Eckler, one from Herbert where their fourth down plays, uh, or it's a third down play for Eckler. I think a fourth down play for Herbert and Steven Anderson's the guy who initiates contact and then rolls off of his block and makes his way to the runner and shoves Justin in on that fourth down and shoves Eckler forward to get a first down on both of those plays. So like, man, you can't say enough good things about what Steven Anderson did in that game against Philadelphia. I think if Justin Herbert, you know, doesn't throw for 360 on 32 at 38 and, and scores three total touchdowns, he's your player of the game. Like I'm not exaggerating. That's how good he was in that contest. Yeah. And it, it's great to see the, that group kind of compliment. We know what we're going to get with Keenan and, and we know Mike's ability and, and what Austin brings to the offense, but Getting those tight ends involved, man, I, I think uh, Coach Staley said it on Sunday. I mean, that, that kind of separate, it gives you that winning edge to, to be able to lean on those guys. I mean, Jared Cook's a veteran in, in this league. Donald Parham has, has flashed that potential, and you mentioned the game that Anderson had. So I, I was really impressed with that group. Uh, I, I look at this AFC West in general right now, Money, five and three. The Raiders, I mean, there's a lot going on right now in, in Las Vegas. Uh, the Broncos with probably the most surprising score. It was 30, nothing at one point in Dallas. Right. And then, you know, the chiefs pretty much gifted that game uh, against the green Bay Packers with no Aaron Rodgers. And I don't know if many people realize this, the chiefs are five and four, but they're one in four in the AFC, 
right? So you're already way, way behind the eight ball in terms of winning in tiebreakers and tiebreakers. So, you know, I, I think, like you said, this is a great opportunity for the Chargers. You know, so hold on. Let me ask you this, Chris. So because yeah. I'm trying to figure this out. Who would you rather see win that game? Raiders or the Chiefs? Oof. I'd probably rather see the Raiders win it. Right? Yeah. Like to me that I'm, I'm with you. I think even though, you know, they're, they're five and three, the chiefs are five and four. I, I think I'd rather see the Raiders at six and three. Um, than the chiefs see the Raiders six, schedule, than both teams at six and at, at five and four, the Raiders schedule is pretty, brutal. that's what I mean. It's going to get nasty here. It's going to get they, real they, nasty. Yeah. So like, I'm with you. I, I think I would rather see the Raiders hand the chiefs another loss uh, continue the question marks. Like you said, you know, they needed, you know, that, that Mahomes Tyreek Hill magic to, to sneak out of that one against the Packers and Jordan Hill was starting to find, or Jordan Love was starting to find his, his rhythm um, a little bit toward the back end of that game. And who knows how it would have turned out if they had to punt that thing uh, away, but yeah, I'm, it's, it's interesting. And look, I know I interrupted you there. So I'll just quickly, so you can no, get back no, no, to your, your point. This is what we thought the AFC was going to look like. The AFC West was going to look like. So I, I think that's what's important. Like, just forget about maybe some of the hiccups along the way. Like, when we looked at these rosters, <clears throat> we thought this thing was up for grabs. That the Broncos' defense was that good. That the Raiders' offense was that good. And we got faith in Gus to figure some things out because we saw how good of a coordinator he was when he was here with the Chargers. Uh, and we knew what the Chiefs were. So we assumed this was going to be a nasty division that very well could send three teams to the postseason. You know, a division winner and two wild, two of the three wild cards. So, like to me, we're here right now, and and I'm not surprised. You know, I'm just I'm just not. I think every one of these teams in this division uh, has got enough talent to to get out of this thing with 11 or 12 wins and and the division crown. And, and I don't think there's a, a coincidence here with Denver. Like they got Jerry Judy back. He means a great deal to that offense. Yeah. And they're getting Noah Fant back. And that team, I don't think we've heard the last of them. That's why this critical stretch, man, of course, beat the Vikings, right? Get to six and three. That Pittsburgh game, we didn't know how good that was going to look a month ago. It's looking pretty good now. And it's going to be imperative to, to try to get that win because you drop one to the Ravens, you beat the Browns. And then – an opportunity to go three and O in the AFC West in Denver before Cincinnati. So like I'm looking at this stretch, man, this could really kind of dictate the team we see in December and kind of what they're competing for. Yeah, no doubt. I think, um, you know, again, like you said, focus on the Vikings. The one, I think the one good thing about the the Vikings game is, you know, their defense is, is kind of falling apart a little bit. You know, Mike Zimmer has been one of the best secondary coaches. They've invested so much, in that particular position group. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't quite materialized. Um, you know, I, I, look, Harrison Smith is one of the best in, in the business, no doubt about it. it. It's safety, but you look beyond that and, you know, Mackenzie Alexander has been okay. Shot Breland is, we know darn well that, that Keenan's eight has lunch a million times in, in games. So, you know, you can take advantage of that. So to me, it, it kind of goes back to where we started the conversation <clears throat> and that's, you know, defensively, can you get this thing tightened up? Because it's a good offense. It's a it's a really good offense. So if, if you can allow your offense to get on the field and and make some stops on defense, I, I think this is an opportunity for the Chargers to to build a bit of a lead. And and again, you know, similar to what we saw in that Raider game, try and pull away a little bit and and maybe relieve some of that stress because you talk about the Steelers and, and look, we can do it. They're not going to do it, but yeah. we can do it. We can look this ahead. Is, this is the form to do it. Not, not exactly not the team meeting room. <laughs> the, you know, the Steelers defense is nasty. TJ Watt is a game wrecker. Minka Fitzpatrick is a game wrecker, but their offense isn't good. So I think if you can get a little bit of momentum here from this defense and you can carry it into that game, I, I you know, I don't think it's a, a, a reach to say the chargers defense could have an advantage uh, over the, the Steelers offense. I don't think that's a reach at all. And then if you feel like, okay, whatever happened between New England and Baltimore, we got it corrected. Here's two games in a row where Herbert has been in the conversation as offensive player of the week or Eckler's going for 150 combined. You know, you, I think it's important for the offense to, to continue and specifically for the defense to maybe find a little bit of that identity that we saw earlier in the season um, going into that next stretch of games. Money, you want to tell people about picks for Popeyes? Every Chargers game this season, when the Bolts defense gets an interception, show your game recap email to your local Popeyes, get a free chicken sandwich, 
when you purchase a chicken sandwich at regular menu price. It was actually interesting. No turnovers by either team yeah. on Sunday. And I think that was the first time that that's happened since 2019 in a Chargers game. So not, not used to seeing at least one turnover. I'm looking. I, look, I love selling the picks for Popeye's because it's a delicious sandwich. But uh, I just wanted to make sure I had it right. Yes. Right now, Kirk Cousins uh, is on pace to throw 33 touchdowns and four interceptions. He doesn't uh, want you to get Popeye's Sunday. Yes, Kirk is not interested in you getting Popeye's. He is one of the best at taking care of the football. So uh, this could be a long shot, but who knows? You know, who, who knows? Especially you know, considering although it looks like I think it sounds like we're going to get Asante back this week, which will be a huge bump. You know, it does not look like we're going to get. Uh, Vato, as coach likes to call him, yeah. uh, back. So, you know, probably going to have to be like a Derwin, uh, Derwin, Tranquil, Adderley kind of combination there to try to get there, you know, plus Asante to try to get this thing right and get you some some chicken sandwiches. Yeah, we'll see if Kirk will, will give one up. All right, uh, coming up a bit later, we'll get this week's opposing view from Courtney Cronin of ESPN. But first, Kevin Kugler, Fox Sports, he'll be on the call. We'll talk to him now. All right, Money, let's bring on our first guest, Kevin Kugler. He's going to be on the call with Mark Sanchez in the booth, Laura Oakman on the sidelines. And, and I believe this is our first Fox game for the Chargers, Kevin. So we're pumped to have you, brother. Well, I'm, I'm fired up to be there. I love SoFi Stadium. I'm very excited to see this Chargers team in person. I've been watching uh, watching games this week to try to get up to speed. And uh, I like what I see. It's a fun group. We're going to lean on you here, Kev, as you, you work for Fox, so you get a lot of NFC. And, man, it seems like this Vikings team is a, is a real hard one to, to figure out. Uh, you look at the record, it doesn't seem to match the on-field production. I would agree. It's, it's a, they're a weird team. Um, they are very talented. One of the best running backs in the game in Dalvin Cook. Kirk Cousins is having a tremendous season. But there have just been little things that haven't worked for them. You know, they've had key injuries, and everybody has those. But you've got – Issues on third down, they just cannot convert on third down. The The run game has been good, but it's been a little inconsistent. And they don't score off takeaways. You know, they've gotten 13 turnovers this year, and they've only scored 26 points off those turnovers. So they're not cashing in on the opportunities they have. And, I mean, you look back at their game last week against the Ravens, it's sort of the epitome of how you don't finish a game in the first half. They get a pick. They take it back to the 16th. They lose a yard on first down. They throw two incompletes and they kick a field goal. So they're up, but they only use 16 seconds off the clock, and the Ravens go down and score a touchdown. So instead of up 21-3 at half, they're up 17-10 at half, and you're missing out on opportunities with that. So, And I, and I don't think I'm saying anything that Coach Zimmer wouldn't say. I mean, they've lost out on too many opportunities this year, and thus, as, you know, as has been said, you are what your record is, and that's kind of where they are right now. It's incredible. Five losses by a combined 18 points. They've played a, a few overtime games, I think three overtime games too. So, you know, we, we always talk about the Chargers playing close games and, and being on the, the wrong side of them. Talk about this Vikings team, man. That's pretty much what we've been seeing from the Chargers the last couple of years. Yeah, it's just one of those weird quirks of this game where, you know, and all five of those losses for the Vikings have been against winning teams. So you're, you're trying to figure out how to break through against a winning team. And, oh, look, you got another winning team on the schedule coming up this weekend in the Chargers, but it's just one of those things for Minnesota that when they get into that position, something weird happens. The Cardinals game, the field goal. I mean, you just, you look at everything that's happened with this Vikings team this season and their numbers and their production says this is a five and three or even six and two kind of team, but it's not. They're three and five and you're, you're, you've got a team coming out West this week that's trying to figure out exactly how to get on track after yet another difficult loss against Baltimore last weekend. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, for, for me, is I'm, I'm trying to get ready for this, and I'm sure a lot of fans would, would ask the same thing, Kevin. Just, I can't figure out what they should be on offense. You know, Dal Dalvin Cook is such a good runner, but, I mean, this, this is in the conversation as one of the best receiving duos, and you always look down and you see Kirk Cousins' numbers, and you're like, yeah, I mean, this is a top-five quarterback in the league. Like, what, what is your takeaway when, when you've seen him play and, and when you watch back, kind of like the best way to operate this offense is what? Well, I think the best way is you've got to figure out a way to get Jefferson and Thielen more involved, certainly than he did last week. I think it's five to catches total last week. So you've got to figure, you've got, like you said, you've got two of the best wide receivers in the game. It's a terrific duo, but those guys have to have the ball in their hands more than five combined times. That's just, you're not going to win games with those two guys 
not participating at a higher level. And then you've got to run Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook is a superstar. He is a terrific running back. He is a game-breaking running back. And it's a league that doesn't necessarily have a ton of those game-breaking running backs anymore. He's one of them. So use him as much as you can. He got 105 yards against the Ravens, but like most or 105 of his yards were on three carries against the Ravens this past week. So you've got to figure out a way to get him involved, get the run game going. But one way to do that is Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. And I'm really surprised, Matt, when you look at this Vikings team, that they haven't been more play action heavy, especially with as good as their run game is. Those numbers are way down for Kirk Cousins over the last couple of years. And he was really good off play action last year. I'm really surprised that they've they seem to have gone away from that. And I'm anxious to talk to them before the game on Sunday and, and find out why, because it seems like they are the perfect team to be very effective in play action. Chargers last against the run, too. I think priority A, B, and C is going to be containing Dalvin Cook. But, Kevin, you flip it to the Chargers and just what Justin Herbert did on Sunday. And, you know, Matt's called a, a number of these remarkable Justin Herbert games, and this one's right up there, 32 of 38, 356 yards, three total touchdowns. And I think what's most impressive is – is icing the game that last drive six minutes plus converting two fourth downs and getting the game winning kick just your impressions of Justin's from afar specifically last Sunday against the Eagles oh those two fourth downs were so big because especially with the two failed fourth downs early in the game last week and they kept going for it and you get the two fourth and ones converted and and you get that winning drive he he has the moxie of a championship quarterback he certainly has the talent of a championship quarterback uh I, I think he's one of the best in the game i remember a few years ago when everybody was looking at the veteran quarterbacks and their runs were starting to end in this league and oh my gosh where was this league going to be with quarterbacks are leaving we're losing their you know they're out of their primes where's the league going to go i think the league is in really good shape you've got patrick mahomes and josh allen and, and justin herbert and I don't know that people are talking about it, Justin, as much as they are the other two. And winning, of course, will take care of that. But I think he is every bit as talented as Patrick Mahomes. I think his accuracy is off the charts. I, I love the composure he has. He plays much beyond his years. And we had them in the final game of last year, his final game of the regular season. And it was a, a game against the Chiefs that didn't mean anything. We kind of knew there were going to be changes with the Chargers and the Chiefs rested everybody before they started their run in the playoffs. But just talking with him, it was a game that everybody knew probably didn't mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. And the approach he had was the same as if it were a game that was going to clinch the AFC West for the Chargers. I walked away very impressed in that meeting. And nothing he's done this year has made me think that he has lost any of that that I saw at the end of last season. He's, he's a superstar in the making, and he's going to be a fan favorite for Chargers fans for a long, long time. Um, I'm going to, I'll just ask you this first, Kevin, did you do some Rams games last year? Yep. I did one game. No, I did a couple of games last year, okay. two of them, Eagles, so just, and, uh, Eagles and the uh, Jets. So I'm guessing you, you may have met with Brandon Staley when, when he was the DC there. Yes. Perfect. So you, you've done a couple of Rams games this year. So many people, you know, kind of describe him as the defensive Sean McVay, uh, as someone who's, who's sat with Sean McVay now a couple of times this year and a bunch of times last year, kind of. Does that does that line up for you? Like, how would you describe those two guys is is sort of because they're both young. They both have a ton of energy. But I don't know. I just I don't quite feel like they're similar personality wise. I, I the way I would describe it, Sean McVay is like intensity personified. You're sitting with him and he's like, like ready to just tackle you. You know, it's like the, the office linebacker. You never know when he's going to come over and just smack you. <laughs> and, and you feel like that could happen at any point. Brandon is, you know, don't get me wrong, he's plenty intense, but we walked away from him last year and we got into a great conversation with him in our first meeting about all of the stuff his family had gone through, the cancer and everything else. Right. And it, you walked away from that first meeting, and I can remember this perfectly. It was still with Chris Spielman at the time. He had not uh, abandoned ship to go run the Lions because <laughs> working with me for a full year makes anyone go to the Lions. So he, he was there. Laura was there. I was there. We walked away from that. We thought, this guy is the real deal. I mean, he had compassion. He was unbelievably thoughtful, but you knew what he could. And later in the year, we talked with him and we were talking about the touchdown passes they had given up. He went down and this was late in the year. There are probably 16 or 17 touchdown passes allowed by this point. And he read off, not read off from his memory, 
went through every single touchdown pass that he had allowed his defense had allowed that year and walked us through every play. It was, I, I hadn't seen much like that before. He, he's just, he's incredibly sharp. I thought the best job available in this offseason was the Chargers job. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here with you guys. I, I said that to a lot of people. I thought this was the best job with Justin Herbert and so many things that you had in place already with the Chargers. And what a great fit. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of his. I'm a big fan of what he's been through from a family standpoint. I don't know that I see he and Sean McVay as similar personalities, but I understand where the comparison comes from because they're both sharp in their respective side of the ball. They're both young and they're both very, very good. Kevin, we we're just talking offline about this jumbled AFC West right now. Chargers five and three atop uh, the, the division at the moment, but everybody's got five wins and just the league in general, man, like you guys did the, the 49ers Cardinals game last week and Colt McCoy, no DeAndre Hopkins, no Kyler Murray, no problem, right? What do you make of this league just halfway through the season? I don't know which way is up or down. It's the best reality show going. I mean, yeah. it is the absolute best thing because every single week you roll out. We were talking about this before we came on. A couple of weeks ago, we did the Lions and Rams game at SoFi. And, you know, nobody thought anything about that game. It was going to be close. And the Lions do everything. And it's a terrific game all the way through four quarters. And it, that's what we get every week in this league. And you never can tell. I mean, last week we go into that Cardinals 49ers game. And you guys do this. You look at a game beforehand and you kind of think in your mind, all right, what's going to happen? I yeah. kind of think this is going to happen. I think this might happen. You got no wide receivers. You've got a guy who started two games last year, and they were kind of a mixed bag of production. You lose your one of your top two running backs, the Cardinals do, on the first series of the game. Right. And you're thinking, and San Francisco's getting healthy. They're looking good. They're coming off a big win. You're thinking, they're home. This is going to be, you know how this game's going to go. And it goes completely the opposite. And you can say that about almost every weekend in the NFL. There's three or four games. Look at last week, the Jaguars beat the bills and they hold them to six points that shouldn't happen but there it is i mean the nfl is just the best reality show going and every single week brings us something new and weird when are you getting out to la kevin uh late friday night i've got basketball on friday evening and then i fly out late friday night so we can uh, be there for meetings and stuff on saturday Gotcha. Oh, that's a bummer. You got uh, your man Sanchitos, Mission Viejo Diablos, taking on Corona Centennial in Division I, first round of the CIF Southern Section playoffs. So just a heads up, he may be a little upset or he may be extremely excited about his Diablos making the Division I run here in uh, high school football, where there is no better high school football on earth than in Southern California. He, he is not only going to be either upset or not, but it's his birthday weekend. So we've that? got oh, we've wow. got all kinds of competing things going on for my partner. So hopefully he'll be dialed in by the time Sunday shows up because, you know, all the presents will be open by that point. He'll either know there whether his alma mater won or lost. He'll, he'll either be in a great mood or he didn't get a win and he didn't get anything he wanted for his birthday. And we'll have to just kind of calm him down all day Sunday. Oh, I, I can't wait. Kevin, my, my favorite thing is your Twitter bio and your location rooting against you in a booth. It's just stupendous. <laughs> Good one. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> well, you guys know this. Every one of us as broadcasters is clearly biased against the other team. And whatever the other team is, sure. as you're watching the game or listening to the game, clearly there's bias against the other team. And so, you know, clearly that's it. Since I'm just going to own it, since that's what we all are, biased broadcasters, I'll just own it and I'll root against you, whoever you are, in a booth. You heard Love it there, it. Uh, Bolt Nation. Get after them. Get yeah, after him on social tough. media. I, he hates if, your team. If you're a Charger fan, I, I can't stand your team. But if you're a Viking fan, I also can't stand your there team. There you go. Uh, Be kind to Kevin in his mentions. We, we can't wait to see you at SoFi on Sunday, brother. Thanks again for your time. All right, before we get to Courtney Cronin, a quick note to let you know that Pepsi is handing out the ultimate Chargers fan experience only at 7-Eleven. Rush in, scan the code, enter for a chance to win some awesome prizes. Bolt up with Pepsi. No purchase necessary, must be 18 years or older. Sponsor PepsiCo. For official rules, visit boltupla.com slash 7-Eleven. All right, to get this week's opposing view, let's bring in Courtney Cronin, covers the Vikings for ESPN. And Courtney, I know it's been a, quite a busy week in Minnesota. As we tape this on Thursday, what's the latest? 
Well, the big news this week has to deal with Dalvin Cook, um, who is facing a lawsuit right now. It's a lot of off the field concerns in Minnesota. Cook was practicing on Wednesday and on Thursday. The anticipation is that he will be playing on Sunday. There's no talk of moving him to the commissioner's exempt list after this lawsuit, which is a civil lawsuit, uh, surfaced on Tuesday, accusing him of abusing an ex-girlfriend, which... um, you know, in parsing through all of that with a lawsuit, it is pretty alarming if the allegations do end up proving true. But the Vikings really have had not too much comment about that and just trying to you know, keep the focus on Dalvin Cook is going to play on Sunday. So that's the anticipation for right now. And then the Vikings are also dealing with you know, a bunch of COVID cases. They have five players currently on the COVID-19 reserve list. Dakota Dozier, who was a practice squad guard um, was in the emergency room this week with breathing issues due to COVID. So, I mean, there's just been a lot of stuff off the field and the fact that this team lost by a field goal in overtime and all of these close losses that keep mounting for the Minnesota Vikings, it's really taking a toll on a, the direction the season's going. And I think really the psyche and overall feel of the players and the coaching staff trying to right the ship and, and figure out why this keeps happening. So certainly no shortage of news on and off the field here in Minnesota. And like, oh, by the way, they do play the Chargers on, on Sunday. Like, let's not forget that. They do have a game to prepare for in week 10 in spite of all this other stuff happening. Um, Courtney, I'd love to, to hear your perspective on kind of where you felt things were with Kirk Cousins coming into the season. Um, obviously, there were, again, some more like off the field issues with him, with the, with the vaccine and all mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. But just as far as a team leader, uh, the production has been there year in, year out. Like, is he... Does it still feel like he is the quarterback, the face of this franchise moving forward beyond this season? It really, honestly, I hate giving this answer. It depends what happens these next nine games. Um, You know, we're at the halfway point of the season and he's shown a lot of good and also not some good. I mean, you take a look back at why they lost to Baltimore and how that overtime period went. And I think that they're, you know, sometimes you get risk averse Kirk Cousins And yeah, that results in him having, you know, very few interceptions and turnovers this year, but it's not resulting in giving your receivers a chance to go and win the game, to go and, you know, keep your foot on the gas as an offense against other teams. And the Vikings have certainly played down to their competition, you know, throughout the year. I mean, there's no reason that the Detroit game should have come down to Kirk Cousins leading a game winning drive for a field goal. There's no reason that the Carolina Panthers game should have gone to overtime granted. Yes. The reason that happened was because that was on the defense at the end, but offensively they get in ruts and it's very hard for them to get out of the ruts. And Kirk Cousins cousins can sometimes help them do that. Sometimes he's the catalyst for why they're in it in the first place. So you think about the future here in Minnesota and what that entails beyond 2021 with his contract, he's got one more year. It's a $45 million cap hit. So certainly Um, you're going to, if you're the Minnesota Vikings, you want that number, you need that number to be lower. So you'd be thinking about an extension if he's your guy beyond this year, but there's so many other pieces that factor into this. Like if there is a change in the coaching staff following the 2021 season, are the new coaches going to want to keep Kirk cousins as their quarterback? So like there has to be kind of a, the way that this thing's going to fall in succession after the season will determine whether he's the quarterback beyond this season or not. But I think there's a lot of good with him, but there's also still kind of the same old, same old of who he's been throughout his entire career as a starter in the NFL that's showing up this year too. And Courtney, you said it, there's a game on Sunday and and this is an Mm -hmm. opportunity for the Vikings to kind of try to get back on track. They've had so many close losses uh, what are the Vikings saying about the Chargers and in, in coming out West to play the, the team? Yeah, I mean, I think that they talk about kind of like the way that the defense, that, I mean, honestly, there have been a lot more questions about the off the field stuff that's happened here in Minnesota, um, you know, than kind of the focus being sp- solely on the Chargers, but certainly, you know, what Brandon Staley has built there defensively has kind of been the key point of emphasis certainly Mike Zimmer knows Linville Joseph really well so um, you know obviously knowing what they have up front but Justin Herbert in in the season that he's had and you know Austin Eckler uh, Keenan Allen who I've always thought is one of the more underrated receivers in the NFL those those have all been you know points that the Vikings have touted of like the the type of skill group that they know they're going to air it out and that's exactly what they have to expect when they go into this Sunday and against a secondary that doesn't still doesn't have Patrick Peterson 
and they were shaky at best, um, you know, the last couple of weeks against Baltimore too, and trying to figure out how they can not keep giving up big plays and big drives um, that keep teams in the game and, and the defense right now. I mean, that's, they were gassed. I think 87 plays last week was, was if anybody was on the field, hundred percent of plays, something like that. Uh, it was a lot. So yeah. you got to think this three full three or four days of, of recovery. Is it really enough before you're ready to go play another team where they're going to be throwing the ball a lot and you need to be prepared to be on the field a lot. Like, is that, how is that going to play out for this defense, which, you know, was gassed last week. Yeah. And Courtney, I love it. If you, if you can, I mean, I don't know if they've provided you with any answers, but look, we've known that the Mike Zimmer is one of the best secondary coaches in, in the league. They've invested an incredible amount of capital draft wise uh, in that particular position group. And, and like you said, it just seems like that's the group that's given up a lot uh, on defense. Have, have they kind of been able, have you been able to sort through kind of why that, because you still have Harrison Smith, you mm-hmm. know, one of the best in the business there. So what, what's kind of gone wrong this year? Well, the unfortunate thing you mentioned Harrison Smith didn't play against Baltimore because he 90 minutes before the game was put on the COVID-19 reserve list. So they had to rely on a rookie safety and Cam Bynum, who wasn't even playing safety last week in practice. He was practicing a completely different position. So, you know, a lot of it's been on the fly. And I think with the past defense, you know, a year without Patrick Peterson, um, Bashad Breeland's had a really up and down year. The technique is something that's different here. I mean, he was a great coverage corner when he was in Kansas City, but the way that they're asking him to cover here is different. And it's just taken him a lot of time to think to get that. And he's been hurt too. Um, and then you just have like a, a kind of like a young group of misfit toys where it's Chris Boyd, who's not very, he's not great. Um, Cam Dancer was a starter last year, but it, you know, kind of took a step back this year because he was put in a position where he shouldn't have been starting last year as a rookie, but forced to do it because they had nobody else. Like a lot of guys are still learning how to play this position and their past defense has, you know, you know, really taken a hit because of it. And then on top of the fact that you lose Daniel Hunter and you have like the third worst pass pass rush win rate according to, to our ESPN metrics um, when Hunter's not on the field that's a serious problem because if you can't pressure them up front you're giving you know the receivers uh, from the opposing offense a ton of time um, to get open and you know you're asking your guys to cover and it's it's very difficult so I think it kind of goes both hand in hand as to why the past defense has seen some issues. Courtney, you had a great piece about whether or not the, the Vikings may have hit their ceiling I think with mm-hmm. this group and you know, if, if you get the pulse of the locker room, each season is different. And when you lose five games by 18 points, you have three overtime games and it's going the other way. Sometimes the locker room can get a little restless. So what's your gauge on kind of where the Vikings are as we sit here midway through the season? Yeah, it's tough this year. I think for anybody covering the NFL to not be in locker rooms to truly get the pulse of the team of what it's like on a Monday after a loss. I mean, we're sure. sitting in front of players on a zoom, um, but you know, there've been some play. It's a, it's a read between the lines type year, which, you know, when you hear from Adam Thielen expressing frustrations, a veteran on this team of, you know, we got to quit letting teams hanging around and hang around in games. We have the talent um, to get it done. Well, does that mean that that's a shot at play calling? Not necessarily, but it all kind of goes hand in hand when you have players who believe that they have a killer mentality. Well, coaching and other things have to match that killer mentality. And that mentality has to stretch across all positions, not just receivers who want to go get 50, 50 contested balls and get be given a chance, but the quarterback who needs to throw them that those balls and not be afraid of a cover two look because he's afraid he's going to throw an interception. I think a lot of that boils into kind of where the, where this locker room is like the vibe of the team and whether they think they can actually bounce back and climb out of a three and five hole. I mean, they were at this point last year, I think the last time they were 500 was, you know, November or early December of 2020. It's been a while. Like they've, they've had a lot of ups and downs last like two or three years, ever since that playoff win in new Orleans. And they feel like they're a good team, but how many times can you go in week in week out and keep saying the same things and expect things to change. That's why when the article that you referenced um, about that I wrote about let them hitting their ceiling, it cannot continue this way if they want to be a successful team. And yeah, eight and nine might get you into the seventh seed in the NFC playoffs, but you also have to worry about the Saints. You have to worry about potentially Carolina. Apparently they just signed Cam Newton. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens to get them back on track. But there's a lot that's going on there that could end up becoming a hiccup for them um, in trying to back their way into the playoffs down the road. Courtney, um, 
just for all of the the listeners we have that fancy themselves scouts or future general managers, uh, when the draft was coming around, they certainly did not anticipate Rashawn Slater being available sure. at 13. Uh, he has been fantastic. I'm sure you've seen how good he's been, but um, Christian Derrissaw's name was was mentioned pretty regularly because of how bad the offensive line was this season prior as someone they suspected that was going to be there. I know he was hurt for a little bit, but just kind of how would you describe his his rookie campaigns gone since he he got healthy? Yeah, so he's got three full games under his belt. He started in Carolina. They had the bye. Then it was Dallas and Baltimore. Um, the fact that we're not talking about him, I think, is a really yeah. good thing that he's not coming up in constant conversation. Because really, you only talk about the offensive line when there's, you know, a missed assignment, sacks, um, you know, the quarterbacks under a ton of pressure. And typically that doesn't come from their bookends. Like it comes from the interior, the offensive line. Like the reason we've been talking about the O-line a lot the last, last couple of weeks is because, well, Garrett Bradbury has COVID. Um, you know, he is vaccinated. May he be back this weekend potentially. Um, but Mason Cole in his place did really well. Um, so that's probably where all the O-line talk is. And as it really pertains to Darisaw, I mean, this is a team that had the fewest contributions from rookies of any NFL team this year. And they had 11 draft picks. So one of the biggest classes, so they need him to play. They need their other rookies to play. And, you know, I think that kind of easing him in the way that they did, like I, I saw no signs that he was not ready to take on a fuller load after that Carolina after the, well, first off, I guess it would have been the, um, the Detroit game the week before that's when they were kind of doing like swapping him and, and Rashad Hill, you know, half and half throughout the game. And then he got the start against Carolina after those two games, I saw no reason to keep training wheels on and, and kind of just let him go. And that's, that's been the case. And they're certainly happy about that because they don't have a lot of other rookie contributors this year and you need your first round pick to play. Courtney, you mentioned Linval Joseph, Brandon Staley brought him up, uh, in his press mm -hmm. conference on Wednesday, talking about the fact that he went, he think he hit 16 miles an hour, the fastest of any D lineman <laughs> yeah. in the GPS uh, against the Eagles. Uh, yeah, he, was a, such I remember a that. he was such a productive player for, for the Vikings. Um, what's it going to be like to see him on the other side for some of these uh, Vikings players who, who did play with Linval? It's crazy how relevant he still is here. Um, in spite of him not being here since the 2019 season, like Michael Pierce, who replaced effectively replaced Linville Joseph constantly touts how much he respects Linville Joseph's game. I believe they train together during the summer um, and that he sees so much of what he wants to be as a nose tackle in what LJ was here. And, you know, he's such a special player because of the different type of gap schemes he can play. You can do a lot with him. Um, and that sort of power, that strength is, is so rare, like among, you know, any defensive lineman, but, you know, to have that consistently, avoiding the injuries, you know, like a consistent stretch and everything that he's done throughout his career, you know, that was missed here, especially last year because Pierce ended up opting, opting out due to COVID. So I, I think that LJ, I mean, Mike Zimmer, that's always been one of his favorite players. And I think they're going to, you know, it'll be, it'll be weird to see him kind of, I mean, I've, I've watched a couple of chargers games, you yeah. know, throughout the last few years and, and seeing him in, you know, a different color is weird, but um, you know, the offensive line is in for the interior of the offensive line is in for um, a rough day. They definitely know what they, especially the guys who have been around like Garrett Bradbury. Uh, if he ends up playing, he knows exactly what he's going to go against space. He went against it in practice all the time when LJ was here. Uh, last thing for me, just since we're, uh, we're doing the old nostalgia thing here, Courtney, uh, somebody that, that we certainly uh, loved having around when he was at UCLA and in high school as an H back and a running back, uh, Anthony Barr still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, kind of how, how has his level of play been as he's become kind of that, that cagey old vet here in his career? It, it's been tough for him. Um, you know, this year alone with a knee injury, which very much seems like it's a chronic thing. He was, he's not at practice on Thursday, did not practice on Wednesday. Um, you know, missed the first couple games of the season before I think it was week five against the Browns where he was finally activated or week four it's tough because this is somebody who wants to play came off a pectoral injury last year, you know, fought to get back. And now he's dealing with this knee injury. That seems to be a chronic thing because some weeks he's good. It feels good. He can play, he can practice. And then some weeks like this week, he's not practicing. So clearly it must not be in a good spot. Um, you know, he's 
he, they, they clearly like him here. They liked him enough to restructure his contract to, you know, push money around to keep him here and then make him a free agent next year. So I will be, you know, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet that he'll play this weekend, just given kind of what we've seen and not seen from practice this week. But, you know, he's had, he's had a rough few years just because of all of the injuries he's dealt with and now trying to stay on the field and some weeks it's good, some weeks it's not. Courtney, we'll get you out of here on this. Just what do you think decides this game? A big one for the Vikings is they try to get back into things in the NFC and for the chargers, they're, they're in this crowded AFC West. They're trying Mm -hmm. to get a little separation. Yeah, I think with Minnesota, it's, you know, they're in such a, if you're three and six, like you might be looking at like this regime ending um, with another loss. And that could, if it's three and seven against the Packers at home, who knows if that's enough for the ownership group here to, you know, to make changes. But the way that Mike Zimmer talked about it on Wednesday, when we're talking about, you know, the Dalvin Cook stuff and all of the injuries and you got a player in the hospital because of COVID and like all these all these close contacts, everything else. It's like one thing after another for this head coach and how he's dealt with it. And he actually was pretty calm about it. Like, you know, I I think that that's a sign for him of this is not the first time he's gone through one thing after the other during the season, but they have to stop playing games close, like either get blown out or blow the other team out. Because I think that even for them, like they, like there's such an anxiety that comes with waiting until the last play. Like, you know, it seems honestly, like when they, when they are down by like, you know, let's say like three points, something like that, they have more of a fire under them to keep going on offense than they do if they're up by, you know, two touchdowns the way that they were in Baltimore. So I guess maybe playing from behind in games might actually help them, but you certainly don't want to be in the situation that they've been with so many games being one possession games and coming down to the, to the final possession. Courtney, awesome, awesome insight. Really yeah. appreciate your time. And we, we look forward me. to seeing you at SoFi. Will this be your first time at SoFi? It will be. I'm very excited about it. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing you. We'll see you on Sunday. All right, money. Good stuff from Courtney. Good stuff from Kevin. Uh, we'll end it here. Keys to the game for the Chargers to get to six and three. Yeah, I'll just quickly reset from what we said earlier. One, you know, that defense, get the offense, get the Vikings offense off the field, whether that's third down or not allowing them to, to just churn the clock with the run game. I think you got to give your offense more opportunities. And then for the offense, you know, keep Justin, you know, protected. You did it in the game against Philadelphia, just a single hurry and no sacks. Not going to be easy against this bunch, but I do think there are advantages out there in the secondary. So if they can keep them, you know, clean, relatively clean, you know, maybe it won't be Philadelphia, but somewhere between, you know, how the issues you had against Baltimore and New England and how great you were against Philly, if you can keep it maybe just at least closer to the Philly game, I feel pretty good about them having the advantage on both sides of the ball. Yeah, the Vikings have 27 sacks this year. If you can keep it similar to Philly, I think you'll be in good shape. So we look forward to seeing you guys. Hopefully at SoFi Stadium. Hopefully you'll be out at the game. Um, Also want to mention, Monday, I don't know if you've seen this. We have our Running for History narrative podcast uh, commemorating LT's single season touchdown record. It's a six-part series. Episode two drops on Friday. It's all about the 2001 draft. So some awesome stories going down memory lane. LT breaks some stories to us that we didn't know about. Um, so it's a, it's a good listen if you got the time and you don't have to listen to it tomorrow. I mean, you can, it's, a, it's an evergreen situation here over the next six weeks. So uh, I know uh, hopefully you'll be listening to it, Money. Hey, look, you got seven days between games, right? Uh, plenty of time to, to listen to, to LT tell stories. And look, the, uh, the salad days of the Chargers, right? When, when they had teams that were good enough to win Super Bowls and unfortunately just could not quite get over that hump. There's uh, nothing better than reliving the success of the aughts and the, uh, the early 2010s, no doubt about it. All right, that's going to do it for us. For Matt Money Smith, I'm Chris Harry. This has been Chargers Weekly, Week 10. 